Hello and welcome. What you're about to watch is a primer on privateering, or the operations by nation states during the 17th, 18th, and early 19th centuries, whereby they would issue legal documents to private individuals, allowing them to practice unrestricted naval warfare against the commerce of enemy nations. France, Holland, England, all the great nations of Europe did this at one time or another, issuing these letters of mark. What this accomplished was it allowed a nation to free up its navy to practice those operations which a navy is best suited to, like blockading ports, reducing fortifications, and engaging enemy fleets. At the same time, the privateers, or letter of mark vessels, would profit by taking a vessel and having it condemned at a prize court. This crippled a nation's economy, if you were fortunate, and brought that nation to its knees. What we're going to look at in this video are some of the strategic value of privateers during the French and Indian War, and also some of the tactics that were employed. Those tactics and strategic value were seen in later centuries. For instance, the Germans during the Second World War used the U-boats to attack merchant shipping, trying to bring the Allied nations to their knees. Unrestricted naval warfare is not a 20th century invention. Indeed, it's been practiced for millennia. Join me as we take a look at privateering. During the French and Indian War, known as the Seven Years' War in Europe, privateers relied on speed, ruse de guerre, or deceiving the enemy, and then boarding before significant damage could be done to the prey. While the great navies of Europe relied on raided ships of the line bearing broadsides of great guns, they were intended to be stable, mobile batteries of cannons providing gunfire support to land forces. They were floating arsenals ready to reduce an enemy's coastal fortifications. Naval ships were a strategic, forward-deployed force, capable of projecting a nation's sovereign right to practice commerce upon the seas, and just as today, they were tools of diplomacy. Naval vessels often slugged it out in ship-to-ship -ship engagements, or in fleet battles where dozens of ships of the line could be engaged. Privateers typically avoided damage to their own ship, as that was a cost borne by the owners, and privateering was, after all, about profit. The privateer typically depended on speed and stealth. The last thing a letter of mark vessel wanted to do was engage a naval ship. Utilizing smaller vessels with lighter guns, typically ranging in size from one half pound up to six pounds. The privateer didn't want to destroy his prey, but instead to capture it and its cargo, and have them condemned in a prize court, after which they could be sold for profit, and the proceeds divided between the crew and any investors. The small gun size of the average privateer was more likely to damage a cargo and personnel than the ship. More often, once a vessel had been located, the next step was to overtake it and, if possible, board it without undue violence. The most common deception was to fly false colors, usually the enemies. An English letter of mark privateer would likely hoist the French flag and vice versa. Failing this ruse de guerre, more direct means could be employed. If the merchantman refused to heave to and be boarded, the privateer would give chase, concentrating fire on the weather deck. Swivel guns mounted on the rail or gunwale could affect great damage to the crew and wreak havoc with the standing and running rigging, making it difficult for a vessel to maneuver. Once boarded, all that was left was to fit out the captured vessel with a prize crew and sail it to the nearest port and have it legally condemned. The letter of mark and reprisal authorized the seizure and capture of enemy commerce and naval vessels and granted the status of naval crew and ship to the privateers. This made them, in a sense, an auxiliary navy. Even today, Article 1, Section 8 of the United States Constitution grants Congress the power to issue letters of mark and reprisal. Strategically, privateers expanded a nation's maritime forces for little or no cost, meaning resources could be diverted to building expensive ships of the line, or invested in land forces and fortifications. During the Seven Years' War, over 80,000 sailors were listed on the rolls of the English naval establishment. Another 75,000 were accounted for as the crews of privateers. Because privateers are smaller vessels with smaller crews, 
we can extrapolate that they more than doubled the number of ships available to raid French commerce. In this period, English Letter of Mark vessels captured 641 ships, while the Royal Navy captured another 524. Both the French and British privateers, or corsairs as the French were known, utilized colonial North American ports to secure and condemn prizes, saving them from a hazardous crossing of the Atlantic that could well result in recapture. It was not uncommon for privateers to capture vessels carrying goods bound for an enemy, but transported on neutral flagged vessels. This often became a legal entanglement, as not all courts agreed on the status of enemy cargoes under a neutral flag. At times, this resulted in accusations of piracy on behalf of the neutral nations. This isn't surprising given the course of unrestricted warfare and an absence of international courts. Prize cargoes provided essential goods and wealth to economies that otherwise would have felt shortages due to wartime blockades and interruptions in trade. Privateers, or corsairs, were a financial expedient for nations needing to ramp up naval operations. As commerce raiders, they were an effective strategic tool. Tactically, they filled a niche that released naval vessels to carry out essential strategic operations like blockade, transport of men and material, and conducting offensive naval operations. And they enriched wartime economies by providing employment and literally pumping captured goods into the marketplace. In its infancy, the United States would rely heavily on armed merchantmen, operating under letters of mark to protect her right to carry out international maritime commerce. In the 17th, 18th, and early 19th centuries, privateers were a rapidly deployed maritime component and a force multiplier for nations facing the demanding challenges of funding large national military establishments. <laughs>